Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for joining us for another episode of uh, Condo Insider. And uh, our show is uh, one for people who live and uh, work in condos. And uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, employment laws that would affect associations. And we have our go-to person, John Konorik, Attorney John Konorik. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, John, for being our guest today. Thank you. Uh, why, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? No, oh, um, I'm a uh, managing partner at a law firm called Torkelson Katz. Uh, I've been practicing management employment law for about 35 years in Hawaii. And I do a lot of work with condominium associations, so I know the difficulty that you have spending your free time as homeowners uh, managing people and the property. And there are a couple laws and issues that have arisen this year, uh, one from our state legislature and one from the federal government that I think might uh, impact how uh, we operate. And how are associations affected by these laws? Well, the, the first law involves what you can and cannot ask applicants for employment and also restricts what you can and cannot require them to do with regard to information about compensation. And that uh, was Senate Bill 2351. That is. Senate Bill 2351 became it, it, Act 108. Yeah, and, it be, and it's called the Equal Pay Act, I think. Well, that's what they call it. And uh, the, the purpose of the bill essentially was to further equal pay and employment by excluding consideration of possibly discriminatory past payment practices. So we know that women make less than men on average throughout uh, the country, and we know some minorities on average make less per hour than uh, non-minorities. And as a result, uh, there's been an effort across the country in different jurisdictions to limit the kind of information employers can, can consider in setting a wage rate or a salary for a new hire. Well, how would the how would how would I mean, how would this come about? I mean, when would the employer even be asking the job applicant? So most job application forms mm -hmm. have a portion that asks for your employment history, mm -hmm. and there's a section in there that says, "What were you making? Ah. What was your salary? What so did you, you start? Ask that and what anymore. Did you that will be forbidden." Okay. So beginning January 1, 2019, all employers in Hawaii are prohibited from asking any applicant for employment what their prior compensation has been. It also prohibits any employment agency or agent of an employer from doing any kind of background check to determine what um, an applicant's compensation or benefits were in their past employment. It doesn't forbid you from asking questions about sales figures or productivity or things like that, uh, objective measures of performance, mm -hmm. but it does prohibit any inquiry into an applicant's prior compensation history. And, and why is that? Well, the idea is that if I know that you were making X dollars in your prior employment, I'm only going to offer you a little bit more than that mm -hmm. to get you to come to work for me. Mm -hmm. um, and because the legislature believes there's been historical discrimination against women and minorities, that negatively impacts women and minorities because their rate of pay is going to be set lower than a man's or a non-minority. But is there, I mean, so as the, uh, the prospective employer and, and associations are employers. Absolutely. Right? They're so the legal a, employer of most of their employees, although you do have uh, management companies that assist you in managing your employees and help you in the process of hiring. The legal employer is the association. And many times boards of directors get involved in talking to resident managers that they hire or operations managers or general managers or site managers. Uh, so uh, that means that the board members can't be asking these kind of questions? Absolutely not. You're right. A board member cannot ask any questions about prior compensation. So before you start the process of finding a new resident manager, you're going to have to decide how much are we willing to pay. Now, you can ask an applicant what your salary expectation is, but not how much you were making at your prior employer. I see. Okay. Now, it goes beyond that, though. Okay. So that's the first part of the law. The first part of the law says, thou shalt not ask applicants how much they were making. The second part of the law says, all employees have the right to talk to one another about how much they're making. Okay. So, so what happens now is many employers think it's okay to tell employees 
you know what, our salary information is confidential, don't discuss it. Well, the National Labor Relations Board has said you can't do that, but it's still a lot of people think you can. This law makes it absolutely clear that under Hawaii's discrimination laws, employees have the absolute right to share with other employees how much they're making, what their benefits are, and compare notes. And the reason for that is the, legislature, actually, the yeah. legislature believes that by allowing employees to freely share how much they make with one another, that will eliminate some biases in how pay, pay is practiced. Now, you know, it, you either believe or don't believe that there is inherent bias in setting of compensation, and the legislature apparently does. And so they passed this law to make it easier for employees to say, hey, Jane, how much are you making? And Jane says, well, I'm making $10 an hour. Gee, that's funny. They're only paying me $8 an hour. I think I'm being discriminated against because I'm a man. And that may, gives me the opportunity to use the information I get from coworkers about their compensation to pursue legal claims on equal pay, gender discrimination, race discrimination, and compensation. But doesn't, you know, doesn't uh, the compensation depend on your skills and how long you've been working for that particular employer? It and should. Maybe, and maybe, you know, you've done some, and, you know, extra work. And, and the idea behind the law is that this is going to guarantee that that's all it's based on and not prior compensation history. Oh, it, it seems like it's, it would be counterintuitive. Now, there's some exceptions. Let me okay. go back to the applicant question. Okay. I told you that you can ask an applicant what your expectation is. Right. So that's legit. And then once that's discussed, then you can say, well, we're only willing to offer this, or okay, we can meet that, but not asking questions about their past compensation. On the other hand, if an applicant voluntarily tells you, I was making 50 grand at my prior employer, so I, I want to make at least 55, then it's open door. Once they voluntarily disclose what their prior compensation is, then you can use that to set their new compensation. I see. Okay, so there's that exception if it's a voluntary disclosure. But you can imagine how many cases somebody will say, I didn't voluntarily disclose that, they asked me. So you have to be very careful not to ask. Okay. And train and make sure all board members are aware of that if they're involved in the hiring process. And if you're uh, uh, letting your general manager or somebody in your organization um, hire people, make sure they understand that come January 1, it will be absolutely illegal to ask that question. And the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission and our state law makes it illegal to ask a question even though you don't discriminate on the basis of what you learn from that question. Uh, employers have been fined ten and $20,000 just for asking an inappropriate question. So. Um is the Civil Rights Commission going to be involved? In I the believe so, yes. In, in the it's a part of our employment discrimination law. So that means that the employee who feels discriminated against can go to the Civil Rights right, Commission. Right, and file a claim. And file a claim yep. and, and get investigated. Say, I, I was asked my compensation history. Then you're going to have to say, I didn't ask, they voluntarily disclosed. And then you go to battle over that. So how can you protect yourself? Uh, make sure you train all of your boards. Make sure you train all of the people that do hiring for your condominium that they do not ask and that they can always go back and say, we know what the law is. We were trained. We understand what our limitations are. But let me go to the second part of this law, okay. too. So while I said employees have the right to share that compensation information, um, nothing requires some, you to disclose that. So if an employee comes up to the HR person or the general manager and say, I want to know how much my coworkers are making, you don't have to tell them. But um, if one of your internal employees that knows that information, let's say an administrative assistant sees that compensation history and they share it with employees, arguably this law protects that person from disclosing information even though their job might be to keep it confidential. There's nothing in the law that has an exclusion for employees whose job it is to keep compensation information confidential. Okay, and so would that apply to, you know, a, a lot of uh, the associations use the management companies yes. to assist in the hiring process? Yes. So that would include the staff of management companies? Yes, it would. So the management companies have to now train their property managers? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And, and that's already begun. Uh, all the property management companies that I work with are aware of this law and are in the process of making sure their property managers and the individuals within their organizations that do any hiring know not to ask prior application or prior compensation history 
and understand that employees have the right to talk about it with one another. And 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 so I mean, so how would how would a claim be made by a person who talks to another employee about their compensation? I think I was fired because I talked about my compensation with somebody else. My my boss told me I th he doesn't want me talking about the raise I just got, and I went and told somebody about the raise, and he got mad at me and fired me for disclosing what he told me to keep confidential. So you have to remember, this all feeds into work rules and policies of companies. So if, a, if an association believes it's important to keep compensation information confidential, you can't do that any longer. So that you have to go through your administrative rules and, and maybe policies to see if any of that stuff is there and, yep, and, and yep. get rid of it. And that's, that's the first thing. Everybody should be starting to look through their handbooks and policies. If you use a management company, many of the management companies have already updated their handbooks or will be shortly to make sure it doesn't include any limitations on employees talking about their compensation. Mm -hmm. But if you haven't been updating your handbook annually, I really recommend that you do that, particularly this year for the reason that this law takes effect January 1 and you want to make sure that nothing in your handbook restricts employees from talking to one another about compensation. That's point one. Uh -huh. But there's a whole other law that's applicable that's creating a lot of stir as well. While this law restricts things on a state level, there are laws on a federal level that apply to condominium associations that are being loosened, are made, made, being made easier for employers. Mm -hmm. Um, there's an organization, a federal agency called the National Labor Relations Board. Most people know that organization as the one that uh, manages union elections and union issues and things like that, and they do that. But they also administer a law that, re that applies to all employees, whether or not you're unionized. So most condominium associations are not unionized, mm -hmm. so you kind of forgot about this law until the last eight years during the Obama administration when the National Labor Relations Board went on a campaign to expand the protections for non-union employees to engage in what's called protected concerted activity. Protected concerted activity under the National Labor Relations Act means that I am joining together in some way. I'm reaching out or trying to get other employees to join with me to complain about working conditions. So part of the, part of the issue is if I go to my boss and say, Bill and I were talking in the lunchroom. We think we're underpaid. We'd like a dollar raise. That's protected concerted activity. Also is protected concerted activity if I post on my Facebook page, my supervisor's a jerk. He keeps me working extra hours and doesn't pay me overtime. That's protected concerted activity. Those, those comments, those behaviors are protected under a federal law. And if you were to discipline an employee or terminate them, the National Labor Relations Board could issue a complaint and order that person reinstated with back pay. You'd also have to post a notice that says, I violated the, the law and I violated employees' rights and I promise never to do that again. Well, so well, Why don't we just hold that thought because we're going to take a break now. Okay. And then we'll come back and we, we, you're <laughs> going to explain how we deal with this. Okay, thank okay? you. Okay, uh, so we're going to take a break, break now, and we'll be back with John Knork and learn more about you know how we can uh, stay out of trouble by okay. complying with uh, uh, labor laws that affect associations. Hello, my name is Stephanie Mock, and I'm one of three hosts of Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Food and Farmer Series. Our other hosts are Matt Johnson and Pamai Weigert, and we talk to those who are in the fields and behind the scenes of our local food system. We talk to farmers, chefs, restaurateurs, and more to learn more about what goes into sustainable agriculture here in Hawaii. We are on at Thursdays at 4 p.m., and we hope we'll see you next time. Okay, thank you for, uh, for joining us. We're back with uh, John Knorick and we're talking about labor issues and you're t you were talking about this NLRB 
Uh, the rules. So some people don't even know who the NLRB are. They're yeah. a five-member board in Washington, D.C., appointed by the president. And as you can imagine, if they're appointed by the president, who sits on that board is going to change depending on who's in the White House. Mm -hmm. So for the past eight years, the Obama administration appointed members of the National Labor Relations Board that were more protective of employers' rights. Since Trump has taken office, he's appointing more Republicans who are more protective of business interests. So for the last eight years, the National Labor Relations Board has made it a point of protecting employees complaining about working conditions and telling employers that if you have a rule that in any way would, could possibly chill an employee's exercise of that right, like scare them into thinking they can't do that, it's illegal and we'll strike it down, and anybody can complain about it, and we'll file a complaint and make you post the notice that says you have to change it, and you, you're not going to violate the rules anymore. It creates other problems, too, because if you terminate somebody in violation of that rule, they can get reinstated with back pay, or if there's a unionizing effort and a union loses an election, if they point to an illegal rule, they get a second election. But the most important thing is you don't want to fire somebody for violating a rule that's illegal. So we have to go through our rules to determine whether they're legal. So for the last eight years, employers have been changing their rules to comply with these greater protections. Mm -hmm. Well, what's happened is the National Labor Relations Board, with a new, newly constituted board that's more business friendly, has said, we're going to change all that. We're going to go back to, a way, to allowing employers greater discretion to kind of control employee behavior. And the old rule basically said if it could feasibly interfere with employees exercising those protected rights, it's an illegal rule. Now, the gen new general counsel, the big attorney for the National Labor Relations Board, has said ahead of time, look, uh, we're, dis we're giving up that old test. The board issued a new test that says we're going to balance the interests of the two parties. So we're going to look at what is the business interest for this work rule and what's the protected conduct that might be affected. And if the business interest outweighs the protected conduct, we're going to let say it's an okay rule. So they, they issued basically a, a, a memorandum that broke work conduct rules into three categories. They said, these are rules that are going to be okay. We'll give them the green light. These are rules that, well, depends on how they're written. So we'll give that a yellow light. And rules that cover these areas, we're going to have to look at carefully. And they may or may not violate the law. And then they said, here's a set of rules that are always illegal. That's the red light. You can't, you can't have those rules, or they violate the National Labor Relations Act. The good news is most of the activity over the last year has been in the green light area now, and they basically said work rules um, that cover areas such as civility, workplace civility, no recording or photographing rules, uh, rules against insubordination, non-cooperation with supervisors, disruptive behavior rules, rules protecting confidential business information, rules against defamation misrepresentation, rules against employer, employees using employer logos or intellectual property, rules requiring authorization to speak for the company, and rules regarding uh, disloyalty, nepotism, or some kind of self-dealing. Those are going to be OK from now on. Previously, the NLRB has struck down enormous uh, number of rules from every major corporation in the country. Um, so civility rules. Used to be, under the old law, that I can't be rude to my co-employees. If I had that as a work rule, oh, you can't have that. That interferes with the employees vigorously exercising their Section 7 rights. So a work rule that said you have to treat your co-workers uh, civilly and can't be rude was found to be illegal. So what happens if you're rude to your coworker? You get to be rude because you're, if you're engaging in protected activity. More importantly, the board says that rule itself, even if you don't enforce it, is illegal. So now what we can, now what we know is the board has said we're not going to take that position anymore. And in a balancing of interests, workplace civility rules that say you can't be rude to coworkers are okay again. Now, one of the things you have to realize is most companies, you know, you go through cycles of revising your handbook. If anybody's revised their handbook rules in the last eight years, now's the time to revise them again. Because what we did in the last eight years was pare back on these rules mm -hmm. because of the board uh, saying that you had to allow employees to engage in some abusive, bad behavior because it would allow, uh, would interfere with their protected rights. 
Now the board is saying, no, 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 no. You can have those work rules. Now you cannot apply those work rules in a way that limits your Section 7 rights. These are the protected concerted activity. So I, if, if an employee complains about their wages, I can't fire them because I think they're rude. They're engaged in protected activity. But I can fire another employee who is rude for some other reason. So employers have to understand the, their, their work rules they can have so they can regulate behavior in the workplace better than they used to be able to. But you have to go back and redo your rules. You have to go back and look through all of your rules that were modified over the last eight years and determine whether they fit within one of these nine categories. And if so, you can go back to older language that gave employers more authority and more control over what happens in the workplace. But you know, this, this, uh, the NLRB, which you said is a federal, it's a federal organization yes. in Washington, D.C., yes. right, right? How can it control uh, what an associate, how an association uh, sets up rules for its employees here in Hawaii? There's a sub-regional office here in Honolulu, oh. and anybody can call up the NLRB here in the local office and ask them to file a complaint on an issue. Oh, and, and they... And, and they review it, and they say, yep, we're going to file a complaint, and then you'll get a letter from the NLRB and a call that says, we need you to come in here. We've got a problem with your work rules. Oh, that doesn't... That's, that and doesn't and like if fun. nothing else, even if it's just to change your work rule, that costs you time and money, right? right. You're going to have to hire an attorney. You're going to have to spend your time dealing with this. So the whole idea here is we want people to be aware that the rules have changed, gives you more authority to do things with your workers in the workplace. But in order to do that, you need to look at your work rules and say, OK, we can now say things that we couldn't say before that give us a better idea and a, and a better control over how employees treat one another, how employees treat company information, um, what employees can say to the media about us or to third parties about us. So you can, you can go back to a time when you get better ability to regulate bad behavior in the workplace. The, you, earlier, when you were talking about uh, you know, some of the uh, behavior that was OK, you were talking about people making comments on their Facebook page. Yep. So, so now, under this new regime, is that going to be permitted? Uh, employees cannot be de critical or demeaning to coworkers. However, they can still be demeaning and critical of their employer. So remember what I said, what's protected is the employee's effort to improve their working conditions. So if an employee posts on their Facebook page, my boss is a jerk, I, he makes me work too much overtime, that's protected concerted activity. Because I call my boss a jerk, I can't discipline you. But if I post it on the Facebook page, my coworker's a jerk, he doesn't help me do my job, I can't stand working with him, I could discipline you for being rude to your coworkers, undermining morale and being uncooperative. So I can discipline you for being posting something that's rude to a coworker, but I can't discipline you for posting something that's rude and offensive uh, about your supervisor. But you know, this br brings up a whole new area because you know, in the old days before Facebook. Yes. I mean. I mean, people. I mean, would talk to each other and yes. say things. Yes. And you might hear through, you know, through rumors that so and so says. But now, I mean, it's it's you. You just go on the internet and you can see all, you know. Well, right. But I mean, the, one of the things that's important to most businesses is that their employees work cooperatively together. Mm -hmm. And if you know that somebody you work with has posted stink stuff about you on Facebook, you're not going to feel really good about working with them. So most businesses want to tell employees, don't talk stink about your coworkers on Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and we can enforce that rule now. Before, there, was limit, there were more limitations on being able to discipline an employee for saying negative things about coworkers. They still are able to say negative things about their boss and about the company or about the association, in your example. And, 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 no, no, no and with no consequence. With no consequences. Right. But most, uh, again, this is one of those areas where the manager, particularly, who's going to issue any kind of discipline and apply these, these rules of conduct, has to understand what's protected and what's not protected. Because the work rules now are going to be broader and allow us to discipline employees for bad conduct, but we still can't discipline them for protected conduct. So 
the managers that you hire have to be knowledgeable in this area and or and consult with their management companies to make sure that they're taking appropriate disciplinary action and not violating any of the any of the laws. I mean, this goes to all the different laws, but this one in particular allows employees to engage in this protected concerted activity concept. And you know, a lot of the associations, I mean, they deal, they rely a, a lot on their management companies. Mm -hmm. And and are the management companies, uh, you know, uh, getting uh, information and actually uh, telling their associations that they've got to update their rules on I, I know several that are currently in the process of updating their rules based on what we're talking about today to give authority, more authority to associations. And there are, and all of the associate, I mean, all of the management companies that I've worked with, which are most in town, mm -hmm. um, um, are aware of this new law, all these laws and changes. And then so uh, right now, I mean, if, if people are, are, are watching the show, a lot of them are board members. So, uh, so uh, what would you suggest that the board members do? Ask their ask their property management company to review their handbook to make sure they have up to date work rules that'll give them the greatest authority over the workforce that they want. Without so that they don't get into trouble. So they don't get into trouble by having illegal work rules, and that they take advantage of the loosening of the law to have greater rights. Uh, over their employees, particularly if they've modified their work rules in the past eight years. Okay, and you know, so now, but, but you know, now we know that you know the uh, associations have to look out for not only the Civil Rights Commission, but now we've got to watch out for the, the NLRB. Oh, you do, you do. I mean, I, I mean, I, I've told this before, but there are more. Most people hear this concept of at will. And they think, oh, somehow this is a talisman. It saves me from any liability. If you're at will, I can fire you, and there's no consequence. That's completely untrue. The at will doctrine is simply a contractual theory that says I have no contractual rights greater than an at will employee. That means I, I can be fired for any reason at any time as long as it's not an illegal reason. And illegal reasons are still applicable to all at will employees. You cannot discriminate against an at-will based on their race, sex, religion, national origin. You cannot fire an at-will employee for a reason that violates public policy. You cannot retaliate against an at-will employee because they reported something illegal or took protected leave, and, and, and all those kind of things. So the, the point of it is, at-will is not a protection any longer. There are too many laws that give employees protections and rights beyond at-will status. And what, what the takeaway, I guess, that for the board members who are listening is that they have to be aware of this and make sure that they consult with their property management companies to make so. sure that they are aware of this. And then they should talk, call you or somebody who, uh, who uh, does the same type of law as you do to assist them. I, I agree entirely. I think at this point, given these two changes in the law, every board should be asking their property manager, is our handbook up to date? Do we have, are we, are we complying with the new equal pay law? And are our work rules compliant with current board law? Okay, well, thank you very much for being with us today and, and uh, sharing your information you, uh, with us. And uh, to our viewers, I uh, ask you to uh, tune in next week. And we're gonna be talking about giving uh, access to uh, elected uh, or candidates for elected office to your building, and, and this is something I feel is very, about? very important uh, because you know we got to get uh, condominium owners involved in their community. So thank you for joining us today, and please join us next week for our uh, our um, show on access to condominiums. Thank you, Jay. Thank you.